Burmese pythons were brought to Florida as pets in the 1930s. The state's warm climate allows them to multiply rapidly, devastating native wildlife. Between 2003 and 2011, the raccoon population dropped by 99.3%, opossums by 98.9%, and bobcats by 87.5%. The state, which already has venomous snakes like rattlesnakes and vipers, so adding giant pythons has become an ecological crisis. Can you guess how Florida decided to reduce the negative impact of snakes? They literally released hundreds of deadly, venomous snakes into the wild? So what was the result? A viable solution or another natural disaster? Let's explore. The eastern indigo snake is a giant of the reptile world, stretching over eight feet long with glossy blue snake scales. Strong, intelligent, and perfectly adapted to Florida's ecosystems, it once roamed from South Carolina all the way to the southern tip of Florida, playing a vital role in keeping nature in balance. What really sets this snake apart, however, is its diet. Indigo snakes can eat other snakes, rattlesnakes, cottonmouths, coral snakes, and are completely immune to venom. For Florida's wildlife managers, the eastern indigo seemed like the perfect ally against snakes, a native snake that eats other snakes. Sadly, the eastern indigo snake is unable to defend itself from humans. Decades before the python invasion, the eastern indigo snake was vanishing. Once thriving in the vast 91 million acres of longleaf pine forests across the southeast, the indigo's world collapsed as logging, farming, and development erased nearly all of its habitat. Then came a deadlier blow. In the mid-1900 years, people launched an all-out war against rattlesnakes. They pumped poison gas into underground burrows, hoping to wipe out their feared targets. The rattlers died by the thousands, but so did countless indigos, who often shared the very same dens. The threats piled on. Snake collectors captured wild indigos for the pet trade, expanding roads cut across their remaining habitat, leaving many crushed under tires. Ultimately, their biology leaves them with little chance of recovery. Female indigo snakes only lay eggs every two years, and many of those do not survive. By 1978, the eastern indigo snake became the first snake in United States history to be officially listed as endangered. By 2017, Florida launched an unprecedented mission, bring the eastern indigo snake back from the edge of extinction. Conservation groups, government agencies, and zoos united to restore this keystone predator to its historic range. The Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve in North Florida, one of the last remnants of longleaf pine forests, was chosen as the release site, but there weren't enough wild indigos left to relocate. Instead, zoos and conservation centers bred them in captivity. Young snakes were raised for two years, long enough to grow strong and sharp in hunting instincts. Only the fittest were released, each fitted with a tiny radio transmitter so scientists could track survival and adaptation. The releases began modestly, just a few dozen at a time. Over the years, the numbers grew steadily. By 2024, more than 200 indigos had been freed into the wild. These numbers are impressive, but do these snakes actually thrive in the wild? Can they reproduce on their own, or do they always need human help to survive? The answer came in 2023, and it shocked everyone involved in the project. While checking tracking gear in the Apalachicola Preserve, researchers stumbled on something extraordinary. Tiny snakes gliding through the brush. These were babies. For the first time in over 40 years, wild eastern indigo babies had been born in Florida. It meant the program was working. The snakes weren't just surviving, they were breeding, carving out territories, and restoring their place in the ecosystem. Scientists celebrated, but they also knew this was just the beginning. A few wild hatchlings didn't mean the species was saved, and more importantly, it didn't answer the question everyone was asking. Could these snakes actually fight the python invasion? 
Do you think an indigo snake would fare well against a Burmese python? Comment yes or no. Don't forget to hit the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you haven't already. Tap the like button to let us know this content is making a difference. And if you're watching on your phone, be sure to press the hype button right below. Every hype helps this video get published to more people, and it truly supports me in earning extra income. I promise to keep bringing you even more great content. Despite all the hype about releasing snake killers to fight pythons, the eastern indigo can't actually take down a full-grown Burmese python. The size difference is simply too extreme. An adult indigo maxes out around 8 feet long and weighs maybe 13 pounds. A large Burmese python can stretch nearly 20 feet and weigh over 150 pounds. So if indigos can't kill adult pythons, why did Florida bother releasing them at all? The real value of the eastern indigo isn't in fighting giant pythons. It's in hunting baby pythons before they grow large enough to become unstoppable. By targeting baby pythons, indigo could kill dozens of potential future giant pythons. This realization changed how scientists viewed the entire project. The indigo wasn't a silver bullet solution. It was one piece of a much larger puzzle. And that puzzle included benefits nobody had even considered when the releases first began. Cotton rats are among the indigo's favorite meals. These small rodents reproduce at an incredible rate, with females capable of producing multiple litters every year. Left unchecked, cotton rat populations explode. These rodents devour crops including cotton, corn, peanuts, and sugarcane, the damage costs millions of dollars every year. Cotton rats also carry diseases that can be transmitted to humans. One of the deadliest is the Black Creek Canal virus, which attacks the lungs and can be fatal. By hunting cotton rats, indigo snakes don't just protect farms, they protect human health. And the indigo snakes menu doesn't stop there. Mice, rats, and other small pests all fall prey to this versatile hunter. Each meal helps keep populations in check, preventing any single species from multiplying out of control. But there's another role the indigo plays, one that makes it invaluable to conservationists trying to understand Florida's changing ecosystems. Indigo snakes need vast, unbroken habitats to roam. They travel miles in search of food, requiring a steady supply of prey reliable water sources, safe shelters, and diverse vegetation. If any of these elements collapse, the indigos vanish. If they flourish, it means the land itself is alive and well. That's why scientists treat indigo populations like an early map system. Their presence and ability to reproduce confirm that nature's balance is intact. Their disappearance, on the other hand, is a red flag that something critical has gone wrong. So. When wild hatchlings were spotted in 2023, the news carried far more weight than just, a snake is back. It meant an entire ecosystem was healing. The Apalachicola Preserve had become robust enough to support these elusive snakes again. Food webs were reconnected, habitats were stable, and the land was functioning the way nature intended. But Florida wasn't the only place betting on the indigo's comeback. In 2010, Alabama launched an ambitious effort to bring the eastern indigo snake back to Conecuh National Forest, where it had vanished for decades. Partnering with state agencies, zoos, and conservation groups, the plan followed Florida's model. Raise snakes in captivity for two years, then release them into protected habitats with tracking devices. Over the next decade, more than 200 indigos were set free, but one question lingered. Would they survive long enough to breed? In 2019, the answer stunned researchers. A wild-born hatchling appeared in Alabama for the first time in 60 years. An entire generation had grown up without seeing a native indigo, and now, thanks to years of work, the snakes were reclaiming their home. The project proved restoration was possible, but also underscored a vital truth. Releasing snakes isn't enough. Restoring their habitats is the real key to lasting success. Releasing indigo snakes without fixing their habitat was like dropping fish into a dry lake. 
These snakes depend on longleaf pine forests ecosystems that had been nearly wiped out. To save them, conservationists launched a massive restoration effort, planting millions of pine seedlings and using controlled burns to mimic the wildfires that once kept these forests alive. It was costly, slow, and demanded patience. Long leaf pines take decades to grow into true habitat. But without it, every snake release would fail. Yet even restored woods aren't enough. The snake's survival hinges on another species, one fighting its own battle for existence. The eastern indigo snake's survival hinges on an unlikely ally, the gopher tortoise. Gopher tortoises dig burrows that can stretch 40 feet long and reach 10 feet deep. These underground tunnels aren't just tortoise homes. They're survival shelters for hundreds of other species. When Florida's summer heat becomes unbearable, indigo snakes retreat into gopher tortoise burrows. When winter cold sweeps through, the burrows provide warmth. When wildfires rage across the pine forests, animals huddle safely underground while flames pass overhead. Without them, indigos cannot survive. But here lies the crisis. Gopher tortoises are themselves in decline, under pressure from habitat loss and human development. And if the tortoise vanishes, the indigo vanishes with it. Tampa, Florida, to Sioux, Columbia. Gopher tortoises survive only in very specific habitats, sandy, well-drained soil for digging, open spaces with sunlight, and low-growing plants for food. For thousands of years, longleaf pine forests and coastal dunes gave them everything they needed. But rapid development across the southeast changed everything. Pine forests turned into shopping centers, dunes became beachfront condos, and sandy grasslands disappeared under roads and housing subdivisions. As their habitat vanished, tortoise populations splintered into small, isolated groups. Cut off from one another, they struggled to find mates, and genetic diversity began to collapse. Roads added another deadly barrier. Many tortoises trying to cross were crushed by vehicles, further reducing their numbers. And with fewer tortoises came fewer burrows, stripping indigo snakes and hundreds of other species of the shelters they depended on. The ecosystem began to unravel. Yet habitat loss was only part of the crisis. An even more insidious threat was spreading among tortoise populations. Disease has become one of the deadliest threats to go for tortoises. The most dangerous is upper respiratory tract disease, which causes wheezing, nasal discharge, and swollen eyes. Infected tortoises often weaken over time, unable to eat or breathe properly, and many die slowly. The disease spreads easily when tortoises come into close contact, and here's the tragic irony. Well-meaning people relocating tortoises from construction sites sometimes move sick animals into healthy populations, fueling new outbreaks. Once established, the disease is almost impossible to eliminate. Some populations show infection rates over 50%. Predators add to the crisis. While adults are protected by their shells, eggs and hatchlings are easy prey for raccoons, foxes, and snakes. Invasive species make it worse. Fire ants swarm and kill hatchlings, while feral cats and dogs hunt young tortoises in unsustainable numbers. Combined with habitat loss, these pressures drove tortoises to the brink. Yet another shadowy threat was still looming. Even with legal protections, gopher tortoises remain under threat from illegal capture. Some are sold into the exotic pet trade, while others are secretly moved by developers trying to skirt habitat laws. Each loss is devastating, every tortoise taken is one less breeder, and many relocated animals spread deadly diseases or die from the stress of transport. In 2007, Florida listed the gopher tortoise as a threatened species, granting new protection. But laws alone couldn't stop the decline. Enforcement proved nearly impossible on private lands and remote sites, and the spiral continued. As tortoises vanished, indigo snakes and countless other species tied to their burrows declined too. The ecosystem was unraveling. It seemed hopeless until conservationists unveiled a bold new strategy, one designed to tackle every challenge at once. The best way to save gopher tortoises turned out to be the simplest. 
protect and restore large areas of habitat. Small, fragmented patches weren't enough. Tortoises need space to roam, and so do the hundreds of species that depend on their burrows. Conservation groups and state agencies began acquiring vast tracts of land across Florida and the southeast, restoring longleaf pine forests with controlled burns and creating wildlife corridors to connect isolated populations. One shining example is the Disney Wilderness Preserve, a 12,000-acre sanctuary in central Florida, where thousands of tortoises have been safely relocated from development sites. The preserve protects far more than tortoises. It safeguards entire ecosystems, from indigo snakes and gopher frogs to Florida scrub jays. Smaller reserves and private lands also play a role, with landowners maintaining tortoise-friendly habitats that form a larger network of safe zones. Captive breeding programs add a safety net, ensuring tortoises can be reintroduced if wild numbers collapse. Together, these efforts are paying off, populations are stabilizing, and with them, the ecosystems they anchor. So what really happened a year after Florida released hundreds of eastern indigo snakes? The outcome was far more complex and more important than anyone imagined. No, the indigos didn't wipe out the Burmese pythons. That was never realistic. The pythons are too large, too numerous, and too entrenched for any single predator to eliminate them. But the indigos didn't fail either. They survived, claimed territories, and even began breeding in the wild for the first time in decades. The discovery of hatchlings in 2023 proved the program was working. Yet the real story isn't a battle of snakes, it's about restoring Florida's ecosystems. Indigos help slow python growth, hunt venomous snakes, and control rodents and pests, all while signaling whether restoration is succeeding. Most importantly, the project revealed the truth. Saving indigos means saving longleaf pine forests, which means protecting gopher tortoises, which means preserving vast habitat. Everything is connected, heal one part, and the whole system begins to recover. If you've made it this far, you're really interested. Don't just click like, hit hype. It only takes a few seconds, but it can help this video go a lot further. Every year, more captive-bred eastern indigos are set free in Florida and Alabama. Each release is carefully planned and monitored. Scientists track survival rates, breeding success, and habitat use. The wild population is growing slowly but steadily. More hatchlings are discovered each year. The snakes are spreading into new territories, reclaiming the range they lost decades ago. Longleaf pine restoration accelerates. Millions of seedlings have been planted. Controlled burns mimic natural fire cycles. The ancient forests are slowly returning. Gopher tortoise populations stabilize in protected areas. Disease management improves. Habitat corridors connect isolated populations. The underground architects are rebuilding their networks. But challenges remain. Climate change threatens habitats across the southeast. Development pressure continues. Invasive species keep arriving. The python problem isn't solved. Conservation is never finished. It requires constant vigilance, ongoing funding, and sustained public support. The indigo's recovery is real but fragile. Everything gained could be lost if people stop caring. The snakes that were released a year ago are still out there, hunting in the forests, sheltering in tortoise burrows, and slowly rebuilding populations that once seemed doomed. Some have bred successfully, others have died. All of them are part of an experiment in restoration that continues every day. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and learned something new, don't forget to give it a like and share it with your friends. It really helps the channel grow. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you'll be the first to know whenever we post more incredible wildlife stories like this one. Thanks for being with us on this great journey. Leave your thoughts in the comments and like to help us. Remember to subscribe for more. See you soon.